Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to McMaster University. I don't know if anyone's online. I'm really tired. I was just explaining the fact that I was sitting on a runway out last night for three or four hours in Calgary when the storm blew by. I might be a little tired and not so sharp. Today I'm going to talk to you about some research we're doing here at McMaster University in the Department of Medical Physics and Applied Radiation Sciences. And the title that we've called it today is CT Scans and Exercise, Can They Reduce Cancer Risk? What today I'm going to talk to you about is some research that actually is being done by my graduate students here at Mac, and they're both in the room here, so I'll get to ask them some questions as we go through this, and uh, hopefully everyone will be able to follow it. Oh, well, let's get started. What, what's the, the link between radiation and exercise? Well, a lot of people don't know that uh, when radiation interacts with us, it simply does something that we call creating free radicals. Free radicals are what we call reactive oxygen species. The same thing happens when you exercise. This picture is supposed to represent, I guess, a polar bear exercising. And when we exercise, we uh, metabolize oxygen in our mitochondria. And the mitochondria, through this process of oxidative metabolism, produce these things called reactive oxygen species, specifically superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, and hydroxyl radical. When we, when we get exposed to ionizing radiation, especially low LET uh, ionizing radiation, it interacts uh, with the molecules in our body. And since our bodies are mostly made up of water, most of the interaction happens with water. So when ionizing radiation, it's water, it goes through a process called radiolysis, and the water is broken down into the same free radicals that we produce during oxidative metabolism. So there's the link. When we exercise, we get ex our cells get exposed to uh, free radicals, and when we get exposed to ionizing radiation, our cells get exposed to free radicals. And that ultimately can affect our DNA, depending upon the level of the free radicals that we're being exposed to. So we call uh, the, the free radicals that are in our bodies from oxidative metabolism, endogenous free radicals. We've done a, a number of research studies here at McMaster looking at the way we can change endogenous free radicals and the way we can supplement diet to protect us from free radicals produced by endogenous uh, forms or by uh, exogenous forms like ionizing radiation. So there's many publications in the literature that talks about the number of free radicals produced um, by low LET radiation exposure and comparing that to the natural levels of free radicals produced uh, when we do oxidative metabolism. Bottom line is, is that uh, it's known in the literature that many more oxidative processes happen to our DNA from normal processes through oxidative metabolism than from getting exposed to a few centigrade radiation. Every hour mammalian cells have about 50 to 100 times more spontaneous DNA damage than if they're exposed to a dose of what we call 10 milligray. Now, 10 milligray is the low dose of radiation, and as you see when we go through this, 10 milligray is the dose that you would get if you got exposed to a CAT scan or a CT scan. In fact, here's a picture of a CT scan of a person through the, uh, the thoracic cavity and you can see the lungs in this picture. The arrows represent um, two sort of diseases going on in this person's lungs. This dark spot here represents emphysema. The other spot up here uh, pointing to a white mass is a tumor, a lung tumor. And uh, we always like using this picture because we got it at the cancer center from our colleague Ian Days. And if you look in the top right-hand corner of this picture, you'll see a square package, which is up here, and that's a person's pack of cigarettes that he had when he got his CT scan done for his uh, lung cancer. Well, there's a cause and effect right there on that slide. You've got cigarette smoking, you've got lung cancer. The CT scan itself that was given to this person delivered a dose around 10 milligray. Because it's done with x-rays, and it's a low LET radiation. But I have a range there, and we know now, if you look in the literature, there's a number, a number of procedures that we get through um, medical diagnostics that can cause that dose to increase from 10 to 20 to 30 to 50 to 100, depending upon what the physician wants to see, what the situation is in the patient. And so these doses can escalate to a point where I would call 100 milligray getting up to what we would call the low end, or sorry, the high end of low doses or the very low end of high doses. So 100 milligray from a biological point of view, from an acute exposure, is a high dose. And 10 milligray is a low dose. So we have that range from diagnostic radiation. If you think about uh, a diagnostic scan, typical mammograms or other scans uh, in that, of that nature will give you approximately a one milligray dose of radiation per scan. Now from a cellular point of view or from a microdosimetric perspective, what that simply means is, is that photons of radiation will be going through your body to create this image. And at a one milligray x-ray dose, these tracks represent roughly what you can model um, tracks going through cells. You can see in this picture, there's six different cells, and some cells were never hit with radiation. Some cells get two tracks of radiation through it. 
Some cells get one, some get none. But on average, we say with one milligray, every cell gets exposed to a tr single track of radiation. But one milligray mammogram will expose every cell in the mammary tissue to approximately one photon track through it. Now what happens when the cells get exposed to that photon track or many photon tracks? There's a chance that their DNA can get damaged. Many processes in our cells that, that uh, manage DNA damage, I've labeled three here. This is a model that shows three possible outcomes of DNA damage. We have DNA damage that can be repaired through error-free processes, controlled genetically, um, with different genes in our body. It will restore the cell to normal, so there was no consequence of that DNA damage caused by the photons going through the cells. The other option is, is that the DNA damage can be processed by the cell such that the cell thinks um, it's unrepairable or there is some issue with the type of damage created and the cell can then simply undergo a process of programmed cell death or apoptosis. And that's a picture of uh, some human lymphocytes that basically show four of them that have been labeled with an assay that allows us to tell that their DNA is being fragmented through the process of apoptosis. It's about 40, a 10 percent cell survival there. And of course the third pathway is that if we try, the cell tries to repair the DNA damage and for some reason it's an error through an error-prone process, then ultimately that pathway could lead some, some time down the road through many other steps to the cell becoming a single cancer cell. A single cancer cell then can proliferate into multiple cancer cells and then become a tumor and eventually could, the patient could succumb to it. But there are other systems that can kick in down here like our immune system, which even though the cell can have damaged DNA, go through error-prone processes, go through many steps of promotion and progression, become a cancer cell, we have an immune system that can destroy this cancer cell. And again, the risk to the organism would disappear. So all these pathways can be modulated by biological processes. One of the assays that can be used in the lab to look at transformation or way cell, the way cells turn into cancer is called the transformation assay. This assay uh, has been used for many years. The uh, resu results I'm about to talk about were done by Dr. Ed Azam, who's now in New Jersey, New Jersey Medical School. And he published a paper back in the late 90s that showed that if you look at cell transformation at low doses, you get uh, an interesting result that suggests that perhaps transformation can be reduced by low dose exposures, especially in the range where you expose the cells to a single track of radiation or 10 tracks or even 100 tracks. So this assay here is a, it's showing a picture of a, of a flask containing a number of cells. About 100, 10,000 cells are put in this flask and allowed to grow. Some of these cells will turn into cancer cells, or they'll transform. And we know that because we look at them under a microscope and they look like these things that are clumped cells in a, in a small package. These are called type 3 foci. This, this, this colony that we're looking at here is spreading out on the dish. It's, it's piling up. The cells are piling up on top of each other. They have lost their ability to stop dividing through contact inhibition. We take these cells and inject them into a mouse. They will cause a tumor in the mouse. So we know those cells from this flask are cancers. Those type 3 foci we can score in this flask and get a measure of what the, the risk to this, these cells in this flask was from a particular treatment or experimental um, assay. So here's the work by Dr. Azam that shows that when you expose cells to nothing, some of them turn into cancer cells. And that's the zero milligray dose here. In fact, about 18 cells of the 10,000 that were put in there turn into cancer cells just from doing nothing. That's called spontaneous transformation. So that would be the risk in this model system of developing cancer just from the process of growing in our, in our tissue culture lab. Dr. Azam did is he exposed cells to one milligray, which if you remember, like I said, is like a mammogram or is equivalent to a single track through every cell. One milligray, 10 milligray, which is 10 tracks per cell, and even 100 milligray. Look at the transformation frequency, and the transformation frequency did not increase, it absolutely decreased. And this was done many times. There's statistical error bars on this to show this is statistically significant. Therefore, using this assay, we can conclude that low doses of radiation in the range where you would get exposed to CT scans can reduce cancer risk. Uh, another study done by Dr. Leslie Redpath uh, in, down in California uh, using a similar system showed very similar results. And that is, if you look at no exposure to radiation, you get approximately three transformed cells per 10 of the five cells in the flask. If you give 0.4 milligray, 1 milligray, or 4 milligray, you suppress the level of transformation in the flask. So it's showing that risk is decreasing 
in the range where we'd expose to things like CT scans. And of course, as you increase with dose, the risk goes up, and somewhere around 350 50 milligray, the dose is high enough where you get a, an increase above background, and higher doses subsequently will increase cancer risk as we go. So again, good evidence showing that CT scan type, type like irradiations can reduce transformation, uh, neo, neoplastic transformation in cell, cell lines and culture. Well, if you look at actual cancer risk, this again was doc, done by Dr. Redpath. He looked at a number of studies looking at different types of radiation, cesium-137, um, 60 kVp x-rays similar to mammograms, uh, cobalt-60 radiation. And looked at leukemia and breast cancer incidence and mortality. And if you look at this relative risk graph, risk of one means there is no, no risk. So that's the line that's going across here. If you look at the risk, the relative risk, comparing it to, to one, which is no risk, at the low dose range, most of the data says that the risk is less than one. So in fact, getting exposed to one, 10, or even 100 milligrams in some situations causes relative risk to drop below one, which means it's having a beneficial effect. And somewhere around 100 milligrams, it goes above the line, and we know at high doses, in the high dose range, that we do get increased cancer risk and cancer transformation. So here's a good example of, of real epidemiological data that shows that even these low doses in that range can prevent or reduce cancer risk. So where does that bring us into this? Well, our studies that we're doing now with the, uh, funded by the U.S. Department of Energy are looking at the effects of diagnostic radiation, um, looking at the effects of PET scans, which uh, is largely the work of Christina Taylor, who's in the audience here, and looking at the effects of CT scans, which is uh, the work of Ni Fan, who's also in the audience. So we have two graduate students looking at two types of diagnostic radiation and how uh, those exposure affects cancer risk in a cancer-prone model system. Well, earlier studies looking at cancer risk in this P53 heterozygous mouse model have shown that changes uh, in tumor numbers and latency period can occur when you expose uh, these mice to cobalt-60 gamma radiation. The mice here, uh, if you look at this graph, we look at mice that are P53 heterozygous and uh, look at the cancer frequency in these mice. If we do nothing to these mice, this is the cancer frequency here. So this is the way that these heterozygous mice die from cancer. Because they're cancer prone, they have a genetic defect, the P53 defect, that causes them to develop tumors with time. And you see a number of days going out here, the number of tumors in these mice occur like this. 